And we ask this in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I imagine there are many of us in this room this morning who would categorize ourselves as a child of God. And although we would use that same phrase, hey, I'm a child of God, uh, we might have different conceptions of what that means, what that relationship looks like. Uh, Some of us might think it looks a little bit like a a baby monkey with its mother. You know, the, the mother will carry the baby through the trees, but the baby has to hold on for dear life. Uh, If the baby loses its grip, it's going to lose its life. In fact, more than 25% of macaws don't make it to their first birthday, and falling is a primary cause of death. And some of you, you may think of your relationship with God in those terms. You think, well, God will carry me through life, but I got to hold on to him because if I lose my grip, I lose my life. Others of you may say, oh, no, to be a child of God, it's, it's more like a kitten with its mother. A kitten doesn't cling to its mother's back. It's carried by its mother wherever it needs to be in the mother's mouth. And you say, you know, I don't really have to worry about much in life. God's just going to put me wherever I need to be. I'm going to leave it to him. And so while we might use that same phrase, I'm a child of God, we might have very different conceptions of what that looks like. And so what does it mean to be a child of God? What does it mean to have a God with us? Do we look more like a baby monkey or like a kitten or something in between? Now, that's a question I want to try to address as we look at God's word in the book of Haggai this morning. And so if you brought your Bible, I want to encourage you to turn with me there. If you've got a digital device you can use to pull up the scriptures, I'd encourage you to search for the ESV, the English Standard Version. That's the translation I'll be reading from this morning. And so if you search ESV Haggai, and if you don't know how to spell it, that's okay. The handout we gave you at the door has it written on there, and you can kind of cheat there, look, and you're, you're good. And so if you search ESV Haggai, you'll be able to follow right along with me this morning. And I'm going to begin reading there in uh, chapter 1 with verse 12. We read, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, And Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not, for thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake the nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. And the grass withers and the flower fades. But the word of our God will stand forever, and this is God's word to us today. And what we saw last week in the first 11 verses was that Haggai is speaking to the most faithful of all of the Jewish people. Uh, The Jewish people had been uh, given an opportunity to return from exile in Babylon to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. But we know that more than 95% of the Jews chose to remain in Babylon rather than return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And so Haggai is speaking to the most 
faithful of the Jewish people. And as they return to the land, they are filled with hope that the Lord's going to be with them and it's going to be easy. But when they run into resistance, when things didn't go the way that they planned, they quickly aborted the mission to rebuild the temple and settled for something less than what God had called them to. And we saw last week that this is recorded for us so that we would see that even the faithful can lose their focus. Uh, They became focused on building their own house rather than the Lord's house. And as a result, they lost the Lord's blessings of covenant presence and contented prosperity. Uh, God was no longer with them to fulfill their efforts, but God was there to frustrate their efforts and put distance between himself and the people. And what was true in 520 BC is still true today. I imagine there are many of us here who uh, started out faithfully following the Lord, but somewhere along the way, perhaps, we've lost our focus. And you feel like there is distance between you and the Lord this morning. You can remember what it was like at first when you came to faith in Jesus and, and there was this closeness of relationship with him and it hasn't been that way for a while. And so if that's you this morning, I want you to look at these verses with me and see first the encouraging news that returning to the Lord will restore the relationship. That's what the text shows us, that if you return to the Lord, it will restore the relationship. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, we read that the people obey the voice of the Lord their God. (laughs) Those are powerful words. There are only 38 verses in the book of Haggai, and the Lord's name appears 34 times because the Lord is at the center of this story. And up until this point, we've seen the Lord referred to or God referred to as the Lord, the divine name, or as the Lord of hosts, which is a title that reminds the people that God can marshal all of heaven and earth for his purposes. And in those first 11 verses, we saw God referred to as the Lord four times. We saw God referred to as the Lord of hosts four times. But now in verse 12, something changes. We see a new phrase. Do you see it? He is no longer simply the Lord. He is what? The Lord, their God. I'd underline those words. In case we miss it the first time, it's repeated at the end of verse 12. He is the Lord, their God. If you drop down to verse 14, you see he's referred to not simply as the Lord of hosts, but as the Lord of hosts, their God. Something has changed so that God is not simply the Lord, but he is the Lord, their God. Not simply the Lord of hosts, but the Lord of hosts, their God. What has changed in verse 12? The people have obeyed the voice of the Lord. And you see, this shows us that up to this point, the people, they'd returned to the land, but they hadn't really returned to the Lord. And now, for the first time, they are hearing the word of the Lord and they are obeying his commands. And as a result, the distance between the people and the Lord has been closed. He is no longer simply an all-powerful being. He is their personal protector. He's no longer simply a God, but their God. And what was true for the people there is true for you and me today. You'll notice there in verse 12 that people reverence and honor the Lord. They feared the Lord and the Lord responds by saying in verse 13, I am with you. And the good news is that no matter how deep a hole you may have dug for yourself, no matter how far you may have wandered from the Lord, and you know you've done some things that have damaged that relationship with God, You don't have to get yourself out of that hole for the relationship to be restored. All it takes is one step back to the Lord and the relationship is restored. That's how repentance works. Repentance says, God, I've made a mess of things. I know it. I've done some things that have damaged my relationship with you. And Lord, I want to return to you. I want to take a step towards you so that you and I might have that sweetness of fellowship again. And would you do that right here, right now? I mean, the reality is there are some of you, you've been walking with the Lord 
for some time, but you know somewhere along the way there has been some slippage and there's not quite the relationship with him that there once was. And you can pray right where you are seated, right here and right now, Lord, I am sorry. I know our relationship isn't what it once was, and I know it's because of some things that I've done, and I'm calling out to you, and I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins and to draw near to me in fellowship once again. You see, returning to the Lord restores the relationship. But we're just scratching the surface of this text because it gets better still. I want you to see, secondly, in these verses, not only that if you will return to the Lord, it'll restore the relationship. I want you to see that it is God who both initiates and empowers the return. That it is God who initiates and empowers the return. Because when you are in that place, and some of you are there this morning, where you know your relationship with the Lord isn't what it ought to be, you can feel like, man, I really want to do that. I want to return to the Lord. I want to repent. I want to walk in obedience to his commands. But it just feels like an overwhelming task. You know, you, you look at your life and you say, man, I got this addiction, Aaron, and it's got its hooks in me, and I don't know that I can shake it. Or you say, you know, I, 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 I lose my temper. I'm an angry person. And as I look back at my life, I've been that way for as long as I can remember, and I don't know that I can change. Or you're an anxious person, and the thought of, of trusting in the Lord so that you're not anxious, that makes you anxious. And so you just feel defeated. But like whatever it is that you are dealing with, what I want you to see here in the text this morning is that it is God who initiates and empowers the return. Look at verse 12. How does it begin? It begins with the word, then. That's an important word because it means that the Jewish people, they don't simply wake up one day and say, hey, let, let's obey the Lord today. Their obedience and their return, their repentance, it doesn't come out of the blue. They obey the voice of the Lord in verse 12 because of all that has happened in verse 11, that the Lord has sent a prophet to speak God's word to them. You may remember last week we talked about the fact that up to this point, the, the Jewish people hadn't heard the word of the Lord through a prophet in almost 70 years. And yet, now the Lord has sent the prophet Haggai to them. Look at what it says there in verse 12. They obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him. You see, the good news here is that before you ever take a step Towards the Lord, the Lord has already taken a step towards you. It is God who initiates the return. They, they feel like God is distant and God must have forgotten them and abandoned them, but God is sending his prophet to speak his word to pursue them in love so that they might return to him in repentance and faith. And notice their obedience. Where does it come from? Verse 14. It comes from the fact that the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, stirred up the spirit of Joshua, stirred up the spirit of all the remnant of the people. You see that their obedience doesn't come from goodness within themselves. Their obedience is the result of the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. The Lord comes through his spirit and he generates obedience within them. And so, brothers and sisters, the, the real truth that we have to grapple with this morning is that there is nothing good in us. Like, I don't obey the Lord. I don't do good things because I'm a good person. Any good that is in me, any good that is in you comes from the work of the Spirit in our lives. And so it is God who both initiates and empowers the return. And so if you're here this morning and you're saying, okay, well, how does that happen? Because I feel pretty helpless. If God is the one who initiates and empowers the return, I need to return, but now you're telling me I can't do that. How, how will God initiate and empower a return in my life? Well, he does it in your life the same way he did it here, by speaking his word to his people through the prophet Haggai in verses 1 through 11. And the good news for you this morning is that you are here and God's word is being spoken to you today as well. And telling you that if you return, your relationship will be restored. 
And just as the people did there, the Lord can do now with the speaking of his word. He can stir up your spirit so that you would walk in obedience to him. And so right where you're seated, you can, you can pray silently in your own heart right here, right now, and just say, Lord, would you do that for me? Lord, Lord I, I want to walk in obedience to your commands, but I honestly don't see how I can do that. The addiction is too strong. My anger is too deep-rooted. My anxiety, man, I, I can't get rid of it. So, Lord, would you empower me by your Holy Spirit to walk in obedience to you? Because that is a prayer the Lord loves, and that is a prayer the Lord will answer. And yet I would assume there are some of you here this morning and you still doubt that that is the case. Because you look at your life and you say, you know, Aaron, I prayed for a lot of things and God doesn't seem to be doing much. And so I, I, I prayed for God's help and, and there's nothing happening. And so I'm wondering, like, is God still with me? Like maybe he's abandoned me because nothing seems to be happening. And so if that's where you are this morning, I want you to see what happens in chapter two with me. Because here, here's what the text shows us. The Jews have responded in, a, in obedience and in faith. They've begun work on the temple. Uh, we ended chapter 1 with verse 15 telling us it was the 24th day of the month in the sixth month. And chapter 2 verse 1 begins after a few weeks have passed in the seventh month on the 21st day of the month. And so they have been working on the temple for some time. And as they step back and as they look at the work of their hands, the people are discouraged. And, and they're discouraged because th they look at it and it looks kind of tacky. It doesn't look like much. You know, they, they can remember. Some of them saw, some of them heard stories of the former temple. They know how Solomon was able to hire these craftsmen from afar that were super skilled, how he was able to cover the temple in gold. But Judah is no longer on top of the world. It is at the bottom. The Persian Empire extends from Ukraine to Egypt to India. Now, Judah is smaller than a commute from Austin to San Antonio. And this new temple signifies their insignificance. And I can imagine they're looking at themselves and saying, God, I thought you said that you would be with us. I thought you said that you were going to bless this work. We've, we've obeyed your word. We've listened to you and we've labored for you. And, and we look at this and, and it doesn't amount to much. And so God asks the Jews back then, and he asks you and me, to evaluate our lives and say, how do you see it? Look there in verse 3. He says, who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? The Lord would ask you that about your life. You know, how do, how do you see your parenting? It's often a hard and thankless task. You look at what you're doing and you say, God, it doesn't seem to be doing much in the lives of these kids. You look at your marriage and it's a difficult one. And, and you try to, to labor well for the Lord in your marriage, but your spouse seems unchanged. You, you try to build your business or witness to your neighbors or uh, lead in song at church, teach others the Bible, whatever it is. You look at what you're trying to do for the Lord and it doesn't seem to amount to much. God asks, how do you see it now? And then he goes on. He knows how they see it. He says there at the end of verse 3, is it not as nothing in your eyes? You see, God understands that the, the Jews here, they are discouraged because they are looking at the work of their hands with the eyes of the flesh rather than the eyes of faith. They are discouraged because they are focused on what they can't do. You know, we can't hire skilled craftsmen from afar. We can't afford gold to cover the temple. We can't do this and we can't do that. They are discouraged because they're focused on what they can't do rather than focusing on what God can do. And so God tells them there in verse 4, he says to them and he says to you and me, we need to be strong. He says, be strong, Zerubbabel, be strong, Joshua, be strong, all the people. And do what? Work. 
Why? For I am with you. He says, you you don't have to be afraid, the end of verse 5, because why? The Lord holds the future in his hand. You see, they, they were focused on what they couldn't do rather than what God could do. Notice the promises God makes. He says, look, you work because I'm with you. And you, you can do these things, but look what's going to happen. Verse 6, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth. Verse 7, I will shake all nations. I will fill this house with glory. Verse 9, I will give peace. God says, you're you're focused on what you can't do. You need to be focused instead on what I can do and what I will do. And what happens so often in our lives is that uh, we look at the work of our hands and it doesn't seem to be amounting to much. But brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you this morning, and God's word is here to speak to your heart this morning, that it is God who guarantees that your work, as meager as it may seem, means something. Your work, as meager as it may seem, it means something. It means something because the Lord is with you. It's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. He says, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you know that your labor in the Lord will not be in vain. I like to put it this way. Your work will work because God's at work. God guarantees that your work, as meager as it may seem, means something. And and that means, look, um, as you see these Jewish people, they're looking at the work that they've done to rebuild the temple, and it seems rather insignificant. It's very unimpressive, and they are grieving. God, we thought you were with us. We thought, you know, this was going to be rebuilt in splendor, and you would bless it, and we'd see miracles. And God says, the the, the problem is you don't understand that your work is setting the stage for what I have planned. And so parents, you look at what you're doing on a day-to-day basis, and it doesn't seem to be doing much. And you can be frustrated and discouraged, but when you listen to the Lord and when you labor for the Lord in the lives of your children, you are setting the stage for what God has planned for them. You may be working in your marriage, and it's a difficult one. But when you listen to the Lord and you labor for the Lord, the Lord will use it for his glory. I will use it for my glory. You may be trying to teach some squirrely five-year-olds the Bible, and they won't sit still for more than like two and a half seconds. And you feel like all you're doing is providing snack time and child care. Like, why am I here, Lord? But, But as you... Read God's word, and as you teach God's word to them, God's word is doing its work in their life. And you are setting the stage for what God has planned. But whatever the work it is that God has for you to do, how do you see it? It may be as nothing in your eyes, but if you would see it with the eyes of faith, stop focusing on what you can't do and instead on what God can do, you would see that you are setting the stage for what God has planned. God guarantees that your work, as meager as it may seem, means something. And so, Hayes Hills, let's get our eyes off of what we can't do and onto what God can do. Because you may have heard about the little boy who was sitting on a hillside listening to Jesus teach. And as Jesus taught and the day uh, grew on, the, the people began to get hungry. Jesus sends his disciples out into the crowd to see if they can find any food to use to feed the people. And they come forward with this little boy, and all he has is five loaves and two fish. The disciples are discouraged because they're focused on what they can't do. They say, this is meager. We can't feed these people with this. But that little boy offered it to Jesus in faith, not of what he couldn't do, but of what God could do. And God used it to feed over 5,000 people. You you may have heard about the little boy who was sent to uh, deliver food to his brothers who were fighting on the front lines for Israel. He arrives and he finds the entire army of Israel is discouraged because they look across the battle lines and they see a man so big and so strong that they know that they can't defeat him. And they are discouraged because of what they can't do. 
But that little boy, David, is not discouraged. He is encouraged and he has faith because his focus isn't on what he can't do, but what, on what God can do. And even though he can't fit in a suit of armor and all he has are a few stones and a sling, he steps out confident that the Lord will do his work. Now, you may have heard about the little boy who was born in Bethlehem. At his birth, he was said to be the savior of the world. And people question, how how can this baby be the solution to all this mess? This is just a little thing. It's meager. But that little boy, Jesus, he grew. And he lived a perfect life. And then he went to a cross and he died to take the punishment for your sin and mine. And he was buried in a tomb. But on the third day, he rose from the dead. And he is now exalted and living at the right hand of the Father on high. And because of who he is and what he has done, returning to the Lord will restore the relationship no matter how far you are from God today. You see, Jesus Christ died to take the punishment for your sin. And he lives now in the heavens offering forgiveness of sins and eternal life to all of those who would simply take that turn of repentance and say, God, I made a mess of things. I need your help. I want to follow you faithfully. Would you save me? But because of who he is and what he has done, God always initiates and empowers that return. We love because he first loved us. And because of who he is and what he has done, God guarantees that your work, as meager as it may seem, means something. Because your work right here and right now is setting the stage for what God one day will do. He tells us in this text that a day is coming when he will shake the heavens and the earth. And Hebrews chapter 12, verses 26 through 29, make clear to us that we are not to be looking for literal earthquakes, a building of a literal temple that will be filled with literal gold. But instead, a day is coming when all of creation will be shaken. Uh, like an archaeologist sifts through the sand and only what is eternal will remain. God will remove everything that is opposed to him. The Lord Jesus will return and he will usher in and give to us an unshakable kingdom, a kingdom that will last forever, where all of those who have put their hope and their trust in King Jesus will rule and reign with him for all eternity. So Hayes Hills, your work, as meager as it may seem, means something. Whether it's changing dirty diapers in the nursery or holding your child as they cry in the middle of the night, whether it's teaching kids at Awana Bible verses, whatever it is, it means something because a day is coming when the results of that work will count forever. And so don't be discouraged by focusing on what you can't do. Be encouraged as you look at what God can do. You see, God says, work, for I am with you. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the good news of the gospel 